Marcy. I'm here to talk about accessibility testing with ACTS, which is, well, you'll find out what it is. I did live in Seattle until very recently. I just moved to Bellingham, Washington, which is about 85 miles north, right by the Canadian border. I went to go live near the edge of a forest. I mountain bike a lot, which is why I have bruises sometimes. Um, but that's a big part of my lifestyle. So if you do go to Seattle, sadly, I am not there anymore. Um, but it's still in my heart. I grew up there. You can find me on Twitter at Marcy Sutton. I often answer accessibility questions just because I'm curious to know the answer. If I, if I don't, I'll connect you with someone who does. I'm a senior front-end engineer at DQ Systems, which is an accessibility-only company. That's all that we do, which is really cool to have a company whose mission is for digital equality. Um, then they're headquartered back east, but I work remotely from Bellingham. Oh, and I wanted to mention, um, if you want an Axe sticker, I have some, so come say hello. So test automation. At some point in my career, I did not know how to write software tests. I was a front-end developer, and I saw a lot of broken stuff go out the door. And I really felt like Tony Braxton in this GIF going, whew, once I learned about test automation, I could feel more confident that I could prevent broken code from going out to production. And then accessibility was something I learned about in my career as well, as a way to help more people with the web. Um, there's a really great trailer for the Rio 2016 Paralympics called We're the Superhumans, and I have a screen capture from that with a little boy with a prosthetic raising his hand in class. And depending on how that prosthetic works, or if he's not wearing the prosthetic, that would impact how he, how he navigates the web. You'd probably have to use um, a keyboard or use um, speech to text, you know, different ways of navigating the web. And there's all different kinds of people that navigate the web that might not be able to use a mouse or might not be able to see the screen. People with disabilities um, in some fashion make up about one fifth of the world's population. So it's, it's often swept under the rug or forgotten about or said that's not our audience, but I challenge you to take another look and really consider people who have different abilities, um, and maybe that'll be you in the future, you never know. But this includes people with visual disabilities, including people who are blind from birth or have degenerative vision loss, people who are low vision, uh, maybe they can see some but they have blotchy spots or you know, different varying degrees of vision. People who are colorblind, really, really common, especially in the male population. People with hearing disabilities, including people who are deaf, people who are losing their hearing over time, People with motor disabilities, you know, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, um, many different disabilities go into this motor category, and it, it really means that people can't use a mouse. You know, they interface with the computer in other ways. And then there's cognitive disabilities, including autism, learning disabilities, traumatic brain injury, memory, and attention. And so we need to give people a little more time and simplify things to make sure that they can navigate. So how do these two come together? Because this is always where you know, my style of approaching accessibility and messaging it to you at a mainstream conference is how does accessibility, you know, where does that fit into whatever topic? And today I want to focus on automated testing because in my career, that's how I've managed to um, really prioritize accessibility in the development workflow is by making it modern and finding ways to automate it. That means testing for low-hanging fruit finding things that you might miss just because you're human and you could use a little help from automated, uh, automated testing. You can document accessibility intent. If you're working on a website or a web application or a UI framework, I used to work on the Angular Material framework, and by having accessibility in your automated tests, you can document how they're supposed to work for accessibility. You know, how is this thing supposed to work with the keyboard? If you have it documented in your test coverage, it makes it a lot clearer to other people who jump in to say, this is supposed to work like this with the keyboard. You can prevent regressions. You know, as I mentioned, why I got into test automation was to prevent broken code from going out the door. 
I was the one to break it sometimes, but sometimes other people break it. Maybe they don't fully understand how something works for accessibility, um, and if you don't have test coverage, you might inadvertently break something. So by having test coverage for this, you can have a lot you know, cleaner code preserved over time. And then by including things like accessibility APIs, like the one I'm gonna tell you about today, you can get help from experts. By having all of their knowledge bottled into that, that product or that API, you're really extending your own test coverage to include things that you didn't have to write. At one point, I thought a cool side project would be to write an accessibility checker, and I got as far as labeling. And then I realized there's so many different ways to label things in what we call accessible name calculation um, that I really didn't know that much about it, and I've, I've learned a lot more, and now I work with a team of people who know every niche about it. They know every browser bug and every assistive technology bug that might not ever get fixed. So in APIs for accessibility, you can kind of work around those limitations and have it built into the API. And by pulling that into your tests, you're automatically getting that help. I don't focus on this too much in my talks, but I wanted to bring up some guidelines that really drive some accessibility work out in the field. That includes the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, we're currently on version 2.0, and Section 508. So these are guidelines that really outline how to make something accessible. And Section 508 is the version that um, adheres to government-funded applications and websites. So if you're writing something for the government, you are legally bound to make it accessible as um, as they say in Section 508. WCAG is the more general version of that. Um, it's not tied to the government per se, um, but they're guidelines that really help you get there, you know, help you have a roadmap for making something accessible. And I don't focus on this too much because it's not as exciting, but I wanted to at least make you familiar with these two things because they will come up again later. The accessibility testing situation. So we can automate testing in browsers, but we can't really automate screen readers yet. I'm hoping that this changes. But what this means is that if you're building something for a blind person who's using a screen reader, you can't exactly automate the screen reader to check that it's working correctly. But we can get pretty close by following best practices, you know, by, by knowing what some of the common problems are. If we can develop and design for those problems, and use development tools, that can help us get there. And we can sort of, there might be quirks, but we can get a really long way just by following best practices and using development tools to help us um, get more insight in how to make something accessible. So testing some low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of easy wins that you can do for accessibility, and the first thing you could do is use your keyboard. I know this is a talk about automated testing, but that's my number one testing tool, is the keyboard. And you can automate that, um, and I'll, I'll show you how to do that a little bit. But some other easy wins that tools could help you find include missing labels, invalid ARIA attributes, or other markup problems in your HTML if maybe you spelled a role wrong or you just wrote an attribute incorrectly. An automated tool could help point that out to you so it doesn't ship out to production and end up being a big old mess. You could test for color contrast across your whole application so that people with low vision would be able to see things better. Um, that would help pretty uh, poor contrast on a monitor, for example. So it, a lot of these things, they might be rooted in um, you know, a, a really stark need for somebody who has a disability, but it ends up benefiting everybody when you can do all of these things. You know, for one example, a missing label in a form if you correctly bind a label element and an input element, when you click on that label, it will send your focus to the input. And so when those are correctly bound, that will help a screen reader identify what that input was for, but it really expands the hit area for everybody. And there's so many comparisons like that in accessibility that this really ends up benefiting so many people that like, that's why I like it. I think it's pretty awesome. So, how does this factor into NPM? We have a package on NPM called AxeCore, and it's AXE-Core, and you can go into NPM, pull down this module, and have an API available to you to audit your web pages and tell you, you know, some easy wins that you may have forgotten. Some rules for AxeCore, or for us, the rules as maintainers, are that we want it to have a zero false positive rate. So make sure that the things that it reports to you are actual problems, because otherwise you'll kind of filter it out and go, eh, 
and not put that much faith in the results that it's reporting to you. We want it to be lightweight and fast, so not make you have to go hit the network to or let your code grow legs to go out and you know, get a response from some accessibility API. Uh, you can run everything locally. You could run it sitting on an airplane with no service. Um, as long as you have this module installed, you can run these accessibility checks, be it on localhost or some remote URL. We want them to work in all modern browsers, including touch devices, and the rules themselves are tested. So we really dog food this concept of accessibility testing so that all of our rules and things are automatically tested. So we have a lot of fixtures in our library that set up these common problems, and we make sure that we're catching those errors correctly. So AxCore is a JavaScript library for accessibility testing. It powers browser extensions and other test integrations. We have one for Visual Studio. It, it reminded me earlier with that great Microsoft talk um, that there's a community contributed web accessibility checker for Visual Studio. Um, it's actually integrated into Vorlon JS too, which is another Microsoft remote debugging um, tool. But it, the Axe Core is the list of rules and the underlying engine for running all of these audits. And that's very extensible since it's a, an NPM module. It's a handy unit testing tool, as I'm gonna show you, because once you have this pulled in, you can use the API to run these tests, and then you aren't having to write those label tests like I tried to write. <laughs> I learned how hard that was. It's open source on GitHub, so we take feature requests. You know, if you have an issue, if you're finding like, hey, this is actually accessible and it shouldn't be a failure, we will work with you to get that addressed in the next version. I have an asterisk because there is an enterprise counterpart to AxeCore that is how we fund it. Um, I've worked on Angular before and seen other projects, how they work, and I like this model. Um, a test is the enterprise uh, counterpart to Ax. That lets us fund development so we can offer this really valuable API as a free open source module. It just those updates to the open source version take a little bit longer than the enterprise one. So the list of rules for AxeCore can be found on GitHub under our docs. There's a rule descriptions list, and this is handy because every rule has an ID, and so you can turn these rules on and off using your configuration, and then each one of these rules maps back to WCAG or Section 508 that I mentioned earlier. So, and there's also best practices rules in there that don't quite fit into either one. Um, but this is useful because it's actually rooted in the, the legal requirements that you would have to hit to make something accessible. Um, there's all different kinds of APIs for accessibility and some different checkers. And I like this one because it, it has those low false positive rates, so it'll, you can guarantee that it will find actual problems. But then if you're legally, you know, if you've been sued or you're trying to avoid that, you know, by following these things, you can rest assured that you are actually meeting the legal standard for accessibility. And there's things like ARIA attributes, um, checking whether tab index has been used correctly, and all different kinds of rules. So a quick demo just to show you later on when we run unit tests what we're actually getting. The browser extensions, um, there's a Chrome one and a Firefox one. I'm gonna go pick on a website. Let's see, I need my toolbar now. So let's see how NPM Camp's website looks for accessibility, everyone's quivering in their boots. So once you've got it installed, this is the Chrome extension, I can go to the Axe tab, and I've got this big button that's like, click me. And actually, NPM Camp's site is, is pretty good. There's only one failure, and it's about color contrast. So when I run this checker, um, there's, it says there's 44 violations, so that tells you that overall, the styles for this site could be boosted, the colors could be boosted a bit. Um, and there's an actual ratio that you can hit to make sure that there's enough range in the colors between foreground and background that they become more visible. But Axe will tell you what element it was, it'll tell you which, um, which tag it's under, either WCAG 2 AA or like which actual WCAG uh, rule it's supposed to, to follow. And if I inspect, I can go and look at each element that it, it caused a failure. Failure is such a drastic word, isn't it? <laughs> um, it really should be noted that accessibility is, it's a continuum, it's not a checkbox. So really what we're hoping from people is just recognize that you might need a little more accessibility support and you can add it as you go, you know, iterate on it. It might not be perfect overnight, but as long as you're willing to work on it and, 
and really accept that your users have disabilities, it's like that's what we want. We just want you to work with us to make things more accessible. So NPM campsite is, is doing really great. I want to show you one that isn't, it has way more failures, Amazon.com. If we run a checker, it takes a second, depending on the size of the, the DOM. But they have a lot of different rules that come up, uh, rule failures like area elements, missing alternative text, they have the dreaded color contrast, multiple IDs, um, the HTML element needs a lang attribute, form elements must have labels, and it'll give you uh, suggestions of ways that you could fix this. So those results are specific to this website. They give you things you can go and inspect and act on. And so for me as a developer, like I went to work on this tool because I thought it was really useful. Um, and so that's why I'm working on, on Axe. But those are the browser extensions. Let's get rid of this toolbar. So moving past browser extensions, because that is a pretty manual process. That's something you could run at any stage, and I encourage you to do that. Um, but where the real power happens is if you could prevent a build from going out the door because things regressed or because it had failures. So that's really the, you know, the, the game that I'm after, is trying to prevent accessibility regressions and really catching these in the modern development workflow. Because if you're like manually doing it once in a while, that's good. <laughs> But it would be better if it was throughout your stack, you, you have different people in the organization who take responsibility for it. If you put it in part of your, your development workflow, it becomes more people's responsibility and you can really see changes over time. So you could document the accessibility intent, as I mentioned, you know, making sure that it's clear that something is supposed to work a certain way in your tests. And you can prevent regressions by having tests written and then if they break, you know. Some tools for the job that, that would help you do this are Axe Core, as I mentioned, and then Axe WebDriver JS. And so I'm gonna do demos of both of these tools, show you what they are, how you can use them. The Axe Core API in the latest version, we just launched version 2.0.5, and there's a, a few really handy API methods, including Alley Check and Alley, or A11Y, if you're not familiar, if maybe you see it a lot and you're like, what is that? I tweet it a lot. It's a numeronym for accessibility, so there's 11 letters between A and Y. Gives you a little shorter hashtag. <laughs> um, but alley check is the method you can call to actually run the audit. So, and we'll dive into that in a second. There's also axe.getRules, so you can go and get all the rules, have it return to you all of the rules that are enabled if for some reason you need a list. You can run axe.configure and pass it an options object and then turn rules on and off. So I showed you that rule descriptions page on GitHub that had the tag name for each rule. Um, you can turn them on and off using those, those rule IDs. And then if you have configured some custom configuration, you can reset it back to the default with axe.reset. There's also a plugin system. You can register plugins and then you can clean up. If, you've, if you have registered a plugin and you need to turn it off or reset it, you can run axe.cleanup. And the entire API you can find on GitHub. So let's take a look at axe.allycheck. The context that you can pass in, it defaults to the document, but say I wanna run a, a unit test on a certain part of the document. Um, I don't wanna run all of the tests. Like for example, we had some tests in Axe Core, the actual core tests. Um, because we weren't limiting the context in our Mocha test runner, which has a handy web page, um, it was actually running the rules against the Mocha, um, the Chrome in their tool which wasn't really what we wanted for our own tests. So I used this configuration um, to exclude that part of the document. So maybe you wanna scope your unit tests to be a true unit test and be a smaller part of your application. You can set up this context to either take an element reference that you've already queried in the DOM, you could pass it an element selector, or you can set up this, what we call an include-exclude object where you pass in an array of things you wanna exclude and or things you wanna include um, and these parameters are listed on our API on GitHub, so you can go and read about it, all the options. There's also a config that you can pass in as the second parameter where you can go and turn rules on and off, or you can change how they work completely. Um, and you can actually configure it with your own rules using the axe.configure method. So you've got the context, you've got the configuration object, um, which you could pass in an empty object if the defaults are fine. 
And then you have a callback function to actually do stuff with the results. And the results that you pass back um, have a bunch of good stuff that we saw in action in the browser extensions. So things like what node was it? What rule was it? Uh, what, um, all different kinds of things. There's, there's way more that comes with that results object and we'll see it in a second. So to write some unit tests in your project, you could run npm install axe core and then save dev. As we heard in Steve's talk, which was super helpful, um, there's, it's amazing how many things you, you just miss somehow that he <laughs> brought up in his talk. Um, so if we do save dev, you can add this to your testing, um, testing workflow. And then to run the tests, uh, and it doesn't really matter what test framework you're using, you could use Mocha, you could use Jasmine. Um, so you include or require axe core as a module. And then once you have that, um, that variable for X, you can run axe.ally check. And so I have a test set up where I'm describing a custom component. I have a, um, a test for it should have no accessibility problems. Because we're running the, the axe rules, um, you can scope it, right, to be either the document or a single element. Um, but it's gonna run all of the tests by default. So in theory, these, this set of tests will help you find m the majority of accessibility problems. So it's sort of a, like this is a really powerful test to write because you're pulling in this API, you're not writing every individual test yourself. And so while tests are usually more granular for unit tests, um, this one's pretty, pretty bulky because it's running all of those rules against your one component. So once that, uh, in the callback function, once we have a hold of the results, we can expect that the results.violations array that it passes back to you has no violations. There's a passes array and a violations array. And if it has, if, if it passes everything, awesome. But if it has some issues, there, the results.violations, there will be content there. Um, and so we expect there to be none. And you could write, I, I've written some um, custom checkers for this. I, I'm blanking on the name right now, but um, there's ways that you could modernize um, the, the expectations to be a little more user friendly as well. So let's go do a demo. Uh, Jasmine matchers, that's the word I was looking for. So on GitHub, I have an axe jasmine unit um, demo that you can go and check out to just have some unit tests using Jasmine. And let's go check it out. Axe.jasmine. Um, so in my package.json, and this is where I found Steve's talk to be very useful um, because you can set up some build scripts to this particular um, demo uses grunt, but you could use plain node scripts as you'll see in the next demo. So I've got grunt doing, it's got a, a, the grunt contrib jasmine module that I'm pulling in and then I can pass it uh, the ax, tell it to go look for the axe.js file which comes with ax core when you download the module. And then I'm telling it to go and look at my tests in the spec directory. So if we go and look at the, uh, the test spec directory, in this unit test, I'm sort of setting up a, a little document fragment. So I've got some HTML that should be good and some HTML that should be bad. And so what I can do is go and pass that element into my unit test and you can go get it from wherever. It could come from an API, it could come from a fixture, although that starts to get into more end-to-end -end tests, which we'll look at next. Um, but really what we wanna check is that there's no accessibility failures on this thing and that it stays that way so we can prevent regressions, right? So I've got this element, I can pass it in, um, and I'm scoping it to the taco button, which is a button with the element of, or an ID of taco button. And so when I pass the taco button in, I wanna make sure there's no accessibility failures. And this is a pretty small component. It's just a single button, and so it should be fine. And it is. Um, and then the next test says that it should report that there's some bad HTML in there. Now I've got a field set in here with an input, and it has no label, um, it has no legend, it's, it's sort of missing all of the pieces that would make it a usable input. So if we go over to the command line, and I run npm test because I'd hooked grunt into my npm scripts. It will go and run grunt jasmine and it will pass both of these tests because that HTML was fine. I have a, a little optional console log statement with the entire 
um, object that acts returns. So you could turn that on and off depending on if it's useful. Um, but it will actually report back the same failures as the browser extensions. So if you're comparing one to the other, um, it's sort of just a, a useful thing to know that it is the same set of tests in the browser extension as the uh, um, unit tests. Okay, so that's a quick unit test demo with Jasmine. The next tool I wanna show you um, is Axe WebDriver JS, and that's an open source library that injects Axe Core into Selenium WebDriver instances. So in the Jasmine unit test demo, we were using Phantom, which is a headless browser. It will just run the tests and then you know, be done. Selenium WebDriver, in comparison, will actually open up a browser instance, which is really useful if you are trying to catch things like focus, um, there's some issues with Phantom and actual focus of elements. If they're not attached to the DOM, you might run into issues. And so end-to-end -end or integration tests with Selenium WebDriver for accessibility are super helpful because you can programmatically go and check the accessibility of things in an actual browser. So Axe WebDriver JS just does that like hookup for you. Um, and it's also available on NPM and on GitHub. So some integration testing um, we can just pull in these modules, we've got Selenium WebDriver, we set up a builder, um, and then we go and get a URL and analyze. So it's, it's similar, but it's promise-based and you have to do a little more work. Um, so quickly, I'm gonna go and look at this other demo. And we're actually testing a, an, a pattern library from eBay called Mind Patterns, and it has a bunch of accessible patterns. And they started off really, they're, they're actually really accessible. Um, but I had written this demo a while ago and I had some test coverage um, to say that it should change state with the keyboard. And I'll um, I can show you this. So I've got these patterns. We're looking at the radio button demo. And these things work pretty well. I can use the keyboard to you know, navigate and everything um, and all the stuff. Um, but I'd written this test a while ago and it actually, there was a regression in the library that I found because all of a sudden these were failing yesterday and I'm like, whoa, what happened? It's because there was a regression in this accessible component library. So this is really um, valuable. Um, but the part I want to direct you to is the actual axe call. And so it's really similar to the unit test except we need the axe builder, which is axe webdriver JS and it does the job of injecting axe into the browser that Selenium opens. Um, once it's done and it comes back, we have a hold of that same results object, and I can expect that there are no violations. So let's go run that really quick. Let's see, so I can run npm test because I have that set up in my npm or package.json file. So I have it consoling out the entire results object, um, which gives me a lot of useful things that the browser extension would tell me as well. Um, and there, there's a failure. Um, so it, it expects there to be, um, looks like there's a missing ARIA attribute. So the, those custom radio buttons, when they, before you've interacted with them, it should say ARIA-check to false, so that a screen reader user knows that this radio button isn't checked. Um, so to fix this, um, which I'm out of time, so I'm, I'm not gonna go fix it, but what you would have to do is go into that radio button component add aria-check to false so that it has a default value, and then that test will pass. And so by having test coverage for this sort of stuff, you can totally prevent accessibility failures from making it out to production, which is awesome, because that's, that's why I got into this business. <laughs> so I'm seeing it actually happening, and it's really, really cool. So quickly, getting some help from experts, because like, not, we don't know everything. Like, sometimes we need to reach out for help, um, and there's lots of places you can do that. But for X specifically, I wanna get you familiar with who you might be asking for help, um, besides myself. So Dylan Barrel is the CTO of DQ, and he's just a JavaScript ninja and knows everything about both accessibility and JavaScript, super cool. Um, Wilco Fires is from the Netherlands. He used to work on the QuailJS um, automated testing framework, so he knows his stuff too. And then Ian Kelly um, is very knowledgeable as well about all of this kind of stuff. So if you come and find us in our Gitter room, any one of us might be there to answer a question. It's hooked up to the X Core GitHub repository, so you can come in and ask a question about, you know, hey, I'm stuck on this, how do I get this set up? Or, hey, I'm seeing this issue, like failing, but it's really not an issue, it seems like a false positive. Come and tell us and, and we can help you figure it out. 
And on that similar vein, our GitHub issues are always there for you know, filing issues. Um, Gitter's probably better for asking questions, but it is open source, so we're always there to, to take your questions. To accessibility and beyond. Thanks, that's it.